On February 24, 1972, my mother Toby opened a copy shop in Springfield, Virginia. And she was a 51-year-old boomerpreneur. I guess she wasn't a boomerpreneur. She was not a member of the boomer generation. But she was newly a single mother, and she had a lovely 13-year-old boy that she had to tend for, in addition to opening up a new business. She had absolutely no idea what she was doing. She knew nothing about business, and she knew nothing about printing or copying. But she had been working as an executive secretary in Springfield, Virginia, and she decided that what Springfield needed was what she called a store that sells copies. This is just about exactly the same time that Kinko's was founded on the opposite coast. So it turned out that Toby had a really good idea. And if it hadn't been for the fact that there was this nascent demand for quick printing and copy shops and that kind of thing, our business probably would have failed very, very quickly. But instead, it, shall we say, lingered. This picture shows the shop 20 some odd years later, somewhere around 1994. And at this point, we were actually doing uh, just over a million dollars in top line revenue. That was real money back at that time, still real money today. And it's a very significant milestone that many small business owners shoot for. But what this picture doesn't tell you, as lovely as that storefront is, and the 2,000 square feet of production and office space behind it, it's a veritable palace compared to where we started and how we survived the first 10 years or so. The best example I can give you of our early days is this picture of a 1976 Chevrolet Chevette. Chevrolet Chevette was named one of the 50 worst automobiles ever manufactured. But this was the only car we could afford because we weren't broke, we were poor. And it was tough. We had a very tough time. The only way we were able to get this car, let me point out some of the features of this car. You may notice there's no hubcap. There's no side view mirror on the passenger side. What you can't see is that this car not only didn't have a radio, it didn't have a back seat. That's how cheap this car was. And even so, my mother would not have been able to qualify for the loan for this car, except one of her close friends' name was Armida Pallone. Anybody here remember Mike Pallone Chevrolet? It's long gone, but it was in Springfield. So Armida got into Mike's ear and told him he needed to help Toby get a car. Well, the only car he was willing to risk his wallet on was the cheapest car on his lot, the Chevrolet Chevette. I can tell you it wasn't the hippest ride for a young man to be driving around in at that time. And one time, I got a lot of grief from my friends about it. One time I came out of a house party and found the car up on its side. They thought that was funny. It looked like a roller skate. So as embarrassing as it was to be poor, uh, it wasn't nearly as bad as the frustration I felt about being ignorant. I couldn't understand what was going on with the business. I couldn't understand what was going wrong with the business. I couldn't understand. One thing about a copy shop is all the other small businesses come. It's like the small business equivalent of the neighborhood barbershop. People come, they congregate, they have a cup of coffee, they talk about what's going on with their business and so forth. And so I had the opportunity early on to meet a lot of small business owners. And since that time, I have presented before thousands of business owners. And I have worked with hundreds of business owners. And I know scores of business owners personally. So what I decided was, I took the same approach as Scarlett O'Hara did in, in Gone with the Wind, which was, I made an oath to myself and, and to the universe that as God is my witness, I will never be ignorant again. <laughs> I made it my business to figure out what it takes to succeed in small business. What is it that separates the small fraction of business owners who thrive and succeed from the vast majority who struggle and fail? And I've been working on it and working on it and working on it for a very long time. I'm not able to share all of what I've learned with you tonight, but I'm going to share a great deal of it with you. So, as I mentioned, I started in the early 70s, and that was a long, long time ago. Today, I look like one of these people, and it's shocking to me that that's what I look like. There's a joke, two friends go in the restaurant, one friend looks across the room and says, look at those two old fogies, and the other guy says, that's a mirror. <laughs> so... As much as it pains me, one thing that's odd for me is when I first started business, 
I was 13, nobody took me seriously. I was always the youngest guy in the room. Now I'm the oldest guy in the room. But I still feel like the same guy on the inside. Obviously, I, not in this room, maybe. Yeah, that's good. And which brings up an important question. A, a boomer is somebody born between 1946 and 1964. Anybody here who does not fit in that? Okay. So, okay, that's good. All right, so what has been happening recently? I have a lot of friends from high school and college who never went into business. They all went the more corporate route or they went to the military for 30 years or they worked for the U.S. government. And all the while, I've always been in small business. I had a couple of forays into the uh, corporate world. Didn't go too well. Kind of got chewed up and spit out very quickly. Just didn't, just wasn't me. But as they're retiring now, they're thinking about starting small businesses. And many of them have come to me and said, Frank, you know, you've always been in business. My wife and I are thinking about opening a copy shop or a, a gift shop or a, a curves franchise or a what have you. What do you, th what's that? Bed and breakfast. Bed and breakfast, yeah. I remember I mentioned that to my ex-wife a long time ago and it, that was the first time she threatened to leave me. <laughs> She had been in the restaurant business before. But I'm going to take a quick aside with that. The bed and breakfast is one of the number one mindset issues that I think boomerpreneurs need to address, which is they need to de-romanticize the idea of going into business. It's serious business. There was a, a, a scene in The Godfather, I think it was part two, where, uh, where Salvatore, they're going to take him out and they're going to knock him off because he betrayed Michael. And um, he says, tell Michael it wasn't personal, it was only business. We understand, Sally. So this is something everybody needs to understand. I'll get to it in a, in a moment. If you're thinking about getting in business, be serious about it. So they come to me, they come to me, they come to me. I've been teaching people literally for decades about how to succeed in small business. It struck me that there's a specific set of issues that face people in this age range. So I decided to create something I call Boomerpreneur Academy. And the first part of it is I'm giving this presentation. I'm writing the book that Ken spoke to you about. <clears throat> Tonight, I want to talk about why it's the best and worst of times for you to go into business. What exactly is the Boomerpreneur's Dilemma, which is the bottom line is, should I go into business? And then from that, should I, if so, what kind of business should I go into? And then how can I start and grow a profitable business. I'm going to give you my definition of success, and you will see a little bit of hard-boiled aspect to me as I give you this information. And this is because I have seen personally business failure and the impact that it has on people's lives, on their marriages, on their children, on their future. This is why you have to take it seriously. And this is why I have a very strict definition of success. I'm going to share with you something I call Unlocking the M-Cube. I wrote a book. I, I seem to write a lot of these books. And uh, this is it. It's called Unlocking the M-Cube, How to Master the Six Sides of Small Business Success. You won't have to buy the book because I'm going to take you through it very quickly right here. But it's a very short, cogent approach to what it takes to succeed. Then I'm going to close by talking about the different types of businesses you can start and then wrap up with how do you decide? What, what do I recommend that you do going out of this room? So here's why it's the best of times. Irrespective of what age you are, we live in the age of the Internet. And because I remember advertising in the 1970s and 80s, 90s and so forth, before there was an Internet, I know how much easier it is today than it was then. I also know right now with my consulting practice, I have clients literally around the world that I've never met and probably never will meet in person that I communicate with on a weekly basis using a platform called Zoom that is available for free, but I do the $15 a month upgrade. Things like fulfillment by Amazon. You don't have to have a warehouse. You don't have to stock inventory. You don't have to have insurance to cover fire or flood. Let Amazon do it. And there's a lot of other things just like that where there are virtual businesses that you can sort of layer yourself on top of. I just mentioned the digital communication, but that also uh, reaches out into things like social media and 
uh, just a wide variety of things that we're all aware of. This is a huge deal. I remember at the printing business, it was like going through the Spanish Inquisition to get a merchant account to be able to accept credit cards. It was a really big deal. It was extremely difficult and expensive. But now, there's all kinds of ways that you can accept payment without any pain. Uh, including recurring payments where people get dinged every month and you don't have to invoice them and you don't have to chase them down. There's no, potentially no accounts receivable. That's a big deal, no, no accounts regrettable. Because uh, you can spend a lot of time chasing it down. The whole thing with digital marketing, Facebook's algorithm, did you guys, anybody see the article in the Post recently about people are thinking that Facebook's listening to what you're saying in the microphone of your phone? Because you might say, Dawn dishwasher detergent, and then when you get your phone open or you go back to your computer, there's an ad for Dawn dishwasher. But it's not, they, according to them, they're not doing that, but it's actually a lot more nefarious what they're doing. They're tracking everything you're doing online, and they're tracking everything you're doing offline. So that they will present advertising to you that is most relevant to you, and for which you will have the highest propensity to take action. For me, as an advertiser, this is fantastic. I can reach just the people I want to reach with exactly the message I want them to see, and I can track it down to the penny, what's working and what isn't. In the 19th century, John Wanamaker famously said, I know only half of my advertising works. The problem is, I don't know which half. With Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, all the other online advertising channels, you know exactly what's, work, what's working. And you eliminate what isn't working, you double down on what is working. Mm -hmm. Fantastic acceleration of your ability to succeed. And also, you can turn it on and off. You test, 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 doesn't work, turn it off. Try something different, turn it back on. That's complete, I, I remember, I, uh, I bought an ad in the Yellow Pages, and uh, the, uh, they give me a guarantee, if it doesn't work, you can stop paying for it. So they put on something called a remote call tracking phone number so that anytime that phone number was called, it would only came from the ad in the Yellow Pages. And it wasn't working. So I told them to turn it off. Well, no, no, sir, it's not quite as easy as all that. So anyway, we finally did get it turned off. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, the other thing that turned off was that phone number. Oh, you don't want to pay for the ad anymore? Phone number gets turned off. They owned it. <laughs> There's a much lower downside potential, provided that you don't stick your neck out too far. And one of the things I'll talk about it here is, you don't have to take on any overhead. I work from home, the second bedroom, talk to people around the world, they have no idea where I'm sitting. I have a, a, like a step and repeat backdrop and some theatrical lights and a nice camera, and it looks like, you know, Hollywood, <laughs> but it's just a corner of a bedroom. Uh, I also maintain an office at a uh, co-working facility in Old Town Alexandria. I have no employees. The most employees I ever had was 15. Not good. Some reason employees think they have a life of their own. I don't know where they got that idea. They don't have that 100% commitment to my company the way I think they should. And uh, you know, sometimes they're sick, and the kids get sick. What's this all about? <laughs> uh, I don't think I make <laughs> so I don't, I now have uh, 1099 virtual uh, assistants and contractors. Almost anything you do today has no long-term commitment. You sign a lease on a, on a storefront, you're going to you give know, five years, three years, ten years, whatever it is. These days, you don't. Know, almost every uh, contract I sign is month to month. Mm. Now, for you guys, uh, one of the reasons why it's such a great time, and this may not apply to you, but you're probably a lot more financially stable than you were in your 20s or your 30s, potentially. You are probably more emotionally stable, at least speaking for myself. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, but compared to when you were in your 20s or your 30s. You didn't know it. <laughs> you didn't even know you were out of your mind. <laughs> yeah, and as uh, Ken mentioned, compared to previous generations, we're all a lot healthier and energetic than our predecessors. You have skills that you've developed over the years. You know how to do business. You know how to come into work on time every day. You know how to stick with a task until it's done. Many things that you may not have been quite so good at when you were younger. I can't speak for everyone. I only speak for myself. 
And you probably have a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, better idea what you like and what you don't like. You're less likely to go running off crazily into something that's going to end up making you miserable. But this is also the worst time, or the worst of times, for you to consider going into business. First off, you're only probably going to get one bite of the apple. Me, I've been through 10, 12, 15 different business ventures. And you know what they say, we all uh, learn best from our mistakes? That's how I became an expert. Made a lot of mistakes. And, but for you, one mistake, you could be done. You could lose all of your savings, your nest egg, that's it. And you'd have no time to recover from it. You can't afford that one bad choice. Uh, you, does anybody, well, being an unconscious incompetent means you don't know what you don't know. Not only do you not know about running your business, you don't even know all the things you don't know about running your business. I'm going to talk about the six main things you need to know. And the six things that you can focus on, or sort them out in a certain way so that you focus on the things that you're good at or you want to be good at. And then outsource the others to people who are good at it. One thing, if I could give you one piece of advice that I've learned, and I, I would I share that. Oh, I can't say that. I don't, I don't want to go to some place I don't want to go, so I won't even say that. Is hire people who are smarter than you. Hire people who are better than you at whatever it is that you're hiring them to do. When I was younger, I was afraid to do that because I didn't want them to. It was the imposter complex. I didn't want them to find out that I really had no idea what I was doing. And uh, so I would hire people who were dumber than me. That's pretty dumb early on in the printing business. I really had to work at that. Uh, and I found some real lulus along the way. But I've learned that if you see someone who surrounds themselves with incompetence, and there's somebody who works not far from here, I won't mention, <laughs> but they generally do it because they're afraid of being found out. It's the imposter complex. Don't do that. Um, so you have a high level of ignorance, and I, as I mentioned, I talked about being ignorant difference between being ignorant and being stupid. Ignorant means you just don't know. You haven't been exposed to it. You haven't been taught. You haven't had the experience. But how much time are you going to have to learn? You're going to have to hit the ground run. We're going to have to make this thing happen. We're going to have to go, go, go. So that's another reason why it's a tough time. Another thing you're going to have to come to grips with is, why haven't you ever done this before? Maybe it's just not your thing. Generally speaking, risk intolerance. Uh, I also tell you, marketing, I say I, I look for what is the one thing that separates the people who succeed from those who fail, it's marketing. It's the number one thing. But the problem is, here's the most critical success factor, but as I often have said, for most small business owners, marketing is a mystery and sales is a dirty word. If you aren't willing to market your business, who the heck you think is going to be willing to do it? And if you're not willing to do it, don't go into business. Because if nobody's selling anything, you're not in business. You also may not have experience managing people. And management experience is important even if they're not W-2 employees. <clears throat> you need to be able to know how to get people to do what you need them to do on a consistent basis. And you also have to know how to vet people who are going to be right. For given positions. Not easy. Not my strength, I can tell you. <clears throat> All right, so this brings us to the boomerpreneur's dilemma, which is it's in three steps. First one is should I even start a business? Yeah, I don't want to do marketing, I don't want to do sales, I don't want to manage people, I don't want to risk my nest nest egg. Ah! No, it's not for me. But if you're still considering it, how do you choose the right opportunity for you? based upon your personality, your skill set, your background, and your budget. And once you make the selection to uh, choose a particular business, how do you go about starting and running one successfully? So here comes my definition of success. As a small business owner, we each have our own definition of success personally. And I would never deign to speak to that. There's three reasons why people will leave their current job and branch out on their own, in my opinion. They want more than what they're getting right now. They want more money. They want more uh, satisfaction from their work. Maybe it's creative 
engagement and outlet that they're not getting. They're hammering out widgets on a daily basis and they hate it. And what they want to work towards is more time freedom. They want to be able to go where they want, when they want, period. I know a guy is one of my clients. This guy is he's just magically successful, magically delicious. I, I'm not sure he could, he does train people, but I, I don't think he could train you to be him. He's just had the sort of the Midas touch. He puts his hand to something and it works. But he often says he's not working for money, he's working for time. He works so that he can stop working for a period of time and turn his attention to his family. He has four children, five and under. So he, he needs the time to sleep. But these are the reasons why you would go into business. And here's why it's important for you to understand that. It's because while you're in business, when I say funding your dream life, you better be making more money in fewer hours with less headaches than you were making before in your regular job or else you're not succeeding. And if you're making less money in more hours with less fun in your own business, then the difference between what you could be making on the outside and what's going on with you right now is the price you're paying to be able to say, I run my own business. And I don't have to take grief from a boss. So <clears throat> I would say 18 to 24 months into your business, you should be at that point. More time freedom, more income, less hassle than when you were at your previous job. And you should be building an asset the whole time that you can sell. I recently came across two statistics from two completely different sources. The United States uh, Small Business Administration says that on average every year, 700,000 small businesses are started in the United States. A website called bizbuysell.com says that every year 7,000 businesses are sold. That means 99% of all small businesses that are started, in my opinion, fail. Wait, can you say those numbers again? 70,000 a year? 700,000 are founded and 7,000 are sold. Yeah, but what about the others that are still in business? That's a good point, isn't it? I would say to you, based on my own personal experience, that 80% of those are the walking dead. <laughs> they're just in name. No, they're still in business. I'll give you an example from the printing business. There were many times where uh, we got deep in debt with uh, receivables outstanding that we weren't collecting. Or Xerox, we owed them $30,000 or something for bills that had built up. And I would have to take out a, a, a home equity loan to pay the bills. So you think of money coming out of the business and going into your bank account, right? But a lot of times, in a big chunk, it comes out and you have to make payroll, or you gotta pay the rent, or you gotta pay mother Xerox. And if you don't, then you go out of business. That is the moment in which the business fails in front of God and everyone. But people hang on by the skin of their teeth to keep that from happening. And during that period of time, it's absolute emotional misery. The kids are unhappy, the spouse is unhappy, they're unhappy, the vendor's unhappy, the landlord's unhappy, but it goes on every day. And, and I remember when we at one point uh, down a downtime of the print <laughs> business tried to sell it to a guy, and he looked at our books and he goes, well, you're insolvent. Why would I buy a company that's insolvent? I was like, wow, that was a dagger in my heart. Man, you can call me a lot of things, pal, but you don't have to call me insulting. That's rude. So what I'm saying is, this is why I'm telling you this is serious. Okay? You can lose your home equity. You can lose your 401k. Because you sign personally. You can have a corporation. That doesn't mean people are going to loan you money without your personal guarantee. That doesn't mean people are going to rent you commercial space without you signing for them personally. It just means you might not get sue quite as badly. And let's face it, anybody can sue anybody at any time for any reason. Somebody famously said you could sue a ham sandwich. So what I would like to encourage you to do is to be one of those 1.2 percenters who actually succeed. They are out there. I meet them. But you know what those people are? They're serious. 
They're serious about their business. And think about people you've met who are successful in business. You ever notice they have that little bit of edge to them? A little bit, you know, they're nice and everything. But when if something happens with their business, they, they're boom, they're right on it. And that's a, that's a mindset that you have to take. It ain't joking. All right, so now I want to go into unlocking the MQ. And this is the six sides of small business success. This is how you can become one of those 1.2 percent. M1 is mission. Why in the world have you started a small business? You better have a good reason. By the way, I'll give everybody a copy of these slides, and I'm sorry I should have mentioned that. I'm also recording this, so I'll get you a copy of the audio, and I'll also I combine the slide deck with the audio to create a video. So if you're concerned that I'm going too fast, I'm going this way. All right, here it is. You got a mean business, you got a mean serious business. Think about the person that you worked for, who, who ultimately owned the company. Was that person serious? So the reason why, and it's an expression, serious business. And there's a reason why bosses have a reputation for being hard, hard case. And it's a reason why it's often difficult for women to be successful in business, because they need to be a hard case too. But people seem less willing to take it from them. When I say be clear on your why, I'm sure you guys know about that from being here, but why are you doing this? Are you doing this to, and there's actually a whole list of reasons that I, I've surveyed people about. Some people want to prove something. They want to prove something to themselves, they want to prove something to their wife, they want to prove something to their father, they want to prove something to their boss. You better really need to prove it because that's going to be a tough why to kind of keep you going during the hard times. Some people want to create uh, financial security for the rest of their lives. That's a great why, especially if you're doing it for children or, or what have you, loved ones. Um, some people have a creative urge. They've got the next big thing in their mind. And they just got to do it. That's the Bill Gates and, and uh, Zuckerbergs and Steve Jobs of the world. But there are very few people like that who are as talented and as clear as those people. So whatever your why is, you need to be clear about it. And you have to think about, how's this thing going to end? Nobody ever thinks about that when they go into business. It's kind of like people should think about that when they go into marriage. But they don't think about that either. It's kind of romantic. The way it should end is you sell it at a significant profit. And what you will sell it for is some multiple of the earnings of the company. Thumbnail, a rule of thumb is three times last year's earnings. Or one times last year's revenue. Depends on what your profit margin is. <clears throat> but a lot of times a lot of small business people they get the money on the counter, you know, they get vacations and business trips and company car and this and that, and it never showed up on the bill, on the income statement. Sorry, can't sell that. People, the buyer wants to have numbers that they can believe in. Now, M2 is marketing. I'm telling you, even if you don't have clarity on your why, if you know how to sell, you're in business. <clears throat> and if you don't know how to sell, you are out of business. Uh, I have seen people who had every success factor baked in before they went into business. They had years in industry experience. They had money, capital that they started with. They, whatever. But they couldn't sell their way out of a paper bag and they failed. I met other people who really didn't know what the heck they were doing. They didn't even know what they were selling. They had no money, but because they could sell, they could use the money, the revenue from the sales to be their startup capital, be their working capital, and then figure it out as they went along. I have an online course called How to Build a Customer Factory for Your Small Business. Excuse me. It's uh, $200, but I'll be happy to send anybody here a free coupon to it if you're interested in taking it. Got to get this straight. Now, here's one thing I want to point out before I move on. Marketing is before almost everything that you think a business is, which are the other ends I'm going to go through right now. Marketing is more important than money because of what I just said. I've seen people sell, and that was it. They got people to give them a check. It's a trick. How do you go from never heard of you to here's my credit card number? It's a trick. It's a skill that you can learn, that I have learned. Also, money is not, it is the end all, and it is the, the goal, I guess, 
but it's also a tool within business. A business cannot exist without it, and you have to learn how to use it. You have to be adept at borrowing it, lending it, allocating it, making sure that you're not going to run out of it. A lot of companies go out of business not because they didn't work selling things at a profit, but because they ran out of cash. Can't let that happen. You always need to price for profit. There's people, the number one thing people do, especially if they're not good at marketing, is they will discount. No good. You can't do that. You have to sell a premium product, a premium service for a premium price. And you have to become what's called accounting literate. How many people here have heard of the expression financial literacy? Okay. How many people have heard the expression accounting literacy? Me either until a little while ago. So I have a client, and they're based in Geneva, Switzerland. They have a thing called color accounting. They teach people accounting in a totally revolutionary way. But if you if you can't read, we would say you're illiterate. If you can't read your financial statements, you're accounting illiterate. And most people can't read them. But it turns out they're a lot simpler than you think. Did you know that on an income statement and a balance sheet, it's nothing but addition and subtraction? Sometimes there's some multiplication and division if they put percentages out on the right uh, column. It's not the numbers that confuse people, it's the words. It's the language. That's what people don't understand about accounting. If you're going to be in business, no you can't. Number four is machine. This is actually running your business. This comes in number four. Okay, if you're an orthodontist, this is orthodontia. One thing you need to be aware of is there's a, how many people have read the book, The E-Myth? Anybody heard of it? Okay. The E-Myth is the entrepreneurial myth that people who own businesses, <coughs> excuse me, are entrepreneurs. Most of them are not. Most of them are either a technician. For example, when I was in the printing business, a lot of people who were great press operators, printing press operators, started printing business. It's really a technician. That's what he wanted to do. Some people are managers. They're good at making the trains run on time. But the entrepreneur, somebody like Sir Richard Branson, can go into any business and succeed because this is the perspective he takes and the skill set that he's developed. He's in banking, airlines, music. These are very disparate industries. You need to decide which one of these is you, and this is one of your decision factors also. Should you go into business? Or which one do you need to do? You need to be, you should be the entrepreneur. I'll give you an example. A guy recently bought a franchise for a kids' tutoring center, math tutoring. He came to our uh, BNI group, and uh, he said, "You know, I just really wanted to teach kids. I didn't want to run a business." Well, he dropped a couple hundred grand on that business, and he's paying a lot of money for rent every month, and he's got liability if something happens to one of those kids while they're on their, his premises. And he's got to hire tutors, and he's got to do this and that, and all these things he didn't want to do. He just wanted to teach kids. He had been a very highly paid, very highly placed executive at a Fortune 100 company. He could have just gone out and taught kids for free. It would have been a lot cheaper. But he didn't think about it. He was the technician. That's what he wanted to do. In fact, what he was looking for was somebody to run the uh, tutorial place so that he could go back to teaching kids. I'm going to have to speed up here. Uh, management, again, this is something that most people don't want to deal with. Uh, this guy, I don't know if you can tell, that's a joint hanging out of his mouth. <laughs> Reminds me of a guy who worked for me at the print shop. <coughs> he would take his lunch break and sit on the hood of his car, his back on the windshield, and, and get, get some rays. And I was like, I guess I can't really you know, fire him for that. I told him I didn't want him to do it. He was kept going anyway. That one time he was laying out there and he had a joint hanging out of his mouth, like this guy. Then I had him, so he was gone. Um, many people don't know this, but Coach Krzyzewski, the dude, he hires assistant coaches, only assistant coaches, who aspire to have a head coaching position at another school. And he knows they're ambitious, he knows they're strong, he knows they're really good, and he knows that they will only be with him for a limited amount of time. But while they're with him, man, they win. That is a winning organization right there. Here's something I've learned. All relationships are temporal. They're temporary. 
Learn that the hard way. People die on you, lives leave you, employees go for another better position. These things happen. And you, so you need to maximize the value of that relationship while they're there. Do everything you can to help them develop their own career and you will attract the right kind of people. And don't hire what I would call chocolate eggs. Frank, so what do you mean by the surplus? I don't quite... I mean, I skipped over that on purpose because I'm short of time, but since you asked. So I have a degree in economics, and back when I was going to school, the uh, Soviet Union still existed, and there was a big thing about the difference between free markets and communism. Karl Marx, the founder of communism, the father of communism, had many concepts, one of which was the surplus value of labor, which is that if I hire somebody to work for me for $5, but I sell their services for $10, I'm exploiting labor. From my perspective, if I can't sell that $5 an hour person for about $30 an hour, I should never should have hired them in the first place. Because I'm paying them for 40 hours a week, and I'll be lucky if I can charge for 10 hours of their time during the week. And I'll be lucky whether they do a decent job on it. I'll be lucky that it doesn't take three weeks just to train them in order to be able to do a $30 an hour job. So you, the surplus value of labor is a real thing, but if you're going to hire somebody, you better, that surplus value has got to accrue to you. And if you can't figure out a way to make it work, don't hire them. So there, Karl Marx. Okay. <laughs> this is where people usually start with their business. It's what I call the minutiae. They want to make sure they got the right corporate form, they got all the forms filled, they got insurance, they got a fire inspection, they got all this. You know, that's great. And you do have to have it, don't get me wrong. But it will not help you to succeed. You can have all of this done five times over, and if you can't sell, that's it. Turn out the lights. So, from my perspective, success looks like this. You start with your mission, make sure you can market, you have enough money, blah, blah, blah. What most people do is this, they start with the minutia, they focus on pulling the teeth or getting the trays to run or whatever it is, and then after that, everything else just kind of happens by accident. They wouldn't ever have paid attention to it if it didn't come, if a problem had not arisen. That's the only reason why they paid attention to it. All right, so that was an uplifting section of yeah. presentation. Yeah. Yeah. All right, everybody ready to start your own know, small business now? I hope you understand that the reason why I'm putting it to you so seriously is I have seen people have their butts kicked to time and time again. And I'm going to stop this a story I'm going to tell. I walked into a restaurant that was being open. It was in the course of being built out in Springfield. And uh, I saw all this beautiful, brand new kitchen equipment. Incredible build out. Just to, oh, I figured, you know, they're spending three or four hundred thousand dollars. And there is this couple, very attractive couple in their 40s. I introduced myself to them. I said, I'm a local marketing consultant. I was interested. I don't recognize the name of this company. I'm not going to tell you what the name of the company is because I don't want to get sued. And uh, I said, how did you, is it, are you the owner? Yes, we're the owner. Turned out they were a dinks, dual income, no kids. Both were SES uh, executives with the federal government. So they were pulling in 250 grand or more a year in gross household income. They've been doing a long time. Had a lot of money put aside. This burger place was something they remembered from their college days. They always wanted to open, let's call it Joey's Burgers. And uh, Joey's Burgers had a chain, and they were the lucky first franchisees of Joey's had ever had. Long story, I told them, and so I keep coming back because I was trying to patronize them and help them out. Every time I go in, there's nobody in there. And the, and the employees are throwing spit wads at each other, and they couldn't keep a chef because chefs like to cook. Nobody comes in, there's nothing to cook. Chefs don't like that. They go someplace they can cook. I'd say it was six or seven months later, they went out of business. In my estimation, they lost five to six hundred thousand dollars. I don't know if that wiped them out. It might not have wiped them out. It may have more than wiped them out. They may have gone into debt in order to support them. But either way, five or six hundred thousand dollars, pretty soon you're talking about real money. <clears throat> They were in their 40, mid 40s, I'd say, so they had time to recover. I hope. So, here's some different business opportunities you can look at and things you need to consider. Uh, how many people were here last week for Faisen's presentation about franchise? Anybody? Okay. So, anyway, she talked a lot about the benefits of franchise. There are many of them if you prefer to work by playbook. 
if you prefer to work within a structure, if you are not the, what I call, more entrepreneurial minded, if you're really looking to what I would call, uh, and I, I don't mean to say this negatively because it's become clear through my speaking with Faisal, this is perfect for a lot of people. Not for me, because I'm, you know, pain in the neck creative type of person. But I've seen many people succeed very well in franchises. But it's a very structured situation. If you prefer structures, that's great. Also, if you are more risk averse, they're generally speaking a more guaranteed success. So, should you buy an existing business or should you start from scratch? In most cases, I would uh, recommend that you not buy an existing business. Really don't know what's going on there, and you've got to understand there's got to be a good reason why they're selling it. Now, if it's somebody who's a true entrepreneur who builds and sells and builds and sells, and, you know, they get bored at the point where it's succeeding, and all the challenge is done. Then, and they have a track record of people successfully buying their past businesses, great. But there's a lot of things that you don't know. Two Jerry's is a printing company that opened uh, near us. These two guys, both named Jerry, they're co-founders, and they had been successful salespeople for a giant printing company in the local area, Belmont. Mm -hmm. And uh, they bought an existing printing company because they had 12-month uh, non-compete clauses. They couldn't go see their clients that they'd been working with Belmont. So they decided if they bought an existing company, it would be they just hit the ground running. Well, they're both salespeople, and now they both had their, you know, tails on the line. They had to make it work. They went out and started selling like crazy, and before you knew it, they had tripled the sales of the business they had bought, and it was before they were able to go talk to their old client. And both of them told me the only mistake they made was buying the existing business. They spent a bunch of money for nothing. They could have started from scratch, and they would have been just as well off that off. Retail is a marketing tactic. People avoid marketing, and so what they do is they open a storefront. Why do they do that? Because people will come in. I don't have to go out to them. I'm not kidding. That's why many people open a storefront. It's because they don't have to go out and talk to strangers. So, <laughs> I used to speak, present, but he said, here's why most people hate uh, selling. When you were a little kid, one of the worst things you could possibly do was talk to strangers. And no matter what you did, whether you talked to a stranger or you broke the front window, the worst way you could do it was on purpose. The problem with selling is it involves every day going out and talking to strangers on purpose. And you know your mother's not going to like that. I'm just saying, you can go retail if you want. But do keep in mind that even with retail, if you really want to drive them in the door, you need to go out there and start hurting them in. You were talking about digital skills required for digital marketing. It's all these wonderful attributes of Facebook and everything else, but yeah, you gotta, you gotta learn it. But there's unlimited upside potential. Another home-based business, cottage industry, that you could do with very little overhead is being a coach or a consultant. You could go back to the industry that you've been working in all of your life and create a business surrounding that. You, real estate agents, Believe it or not, there are real estate agents that make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. They work very hard, and they have teams of people around them, but it's not that unusual. However, there's a huge class of real estate agents that don't make squat douche. <laughs> and the biggest reason, they're not good salespeople. Um, network marketing, the reason <clears throat> I bring this up is not because I think it's a good idea. This is multi-level marketing. But it's because I know that network marketing companies are targeting boomer producers for all the reasons they talked about. They got money, they got time on their hands, they got health, they got networks of people. I would not recommend it. I've actually worked in the headquarters of two different network marketing companies, and I know what the attribute is of the top producers. They're great salespeople. Most of us are not. So, what are you going to do? Here's what I would leave you with in terms of what you should think about before you go after them. Going back to a couple of my M's. How much money do you want to make? It's a great place to stick a stake in the ground. I want to make $10,000 a month take home. And then back up from that, so it's gonna be about $15,000 gross. Because as a small business owner, you pay both sides of the FICA tax. 15, almost 15 and a half percent, right off the top, for FICA and uh, Social Security. 
How much money do you need to get started? There's a lot of things you can do that require almost no money, such as becoming a real estate agent. How much money are you going to need to continue operating the business? How much money are you going to need to keep operating your household? And how much money can you afford to lose? There is risk involved. And if you can't afford to lose any money, don't put it at risk. It's, it's, people do very well. Some people, very small number of people do very well in small business. But most don't. If you're not going to be the salesperson, who's going to be the salesperson? Other people think they can go out and hire a salesperson. You can, but it's very expensive and not always effective, especially if you don't know how to sell, so you don't know how to manage them. And I'll just harp on this. If you're not selling anything, you're not in business. That is the indication that you have a business is people give you money for your product or service. If they don't, you're not in business. I'm not sure what you're doing, but you're not in business. And what's going to be the end game? Business life cycle, very quickly. You start a business, you're a startup phase. Then you go through growth phase, as I mentioned. 18 to 24 months, you should then be at the maturity stage, or at where you're consistently throwing off what an economist would call extraordinary profits, which is more than you could have got if you took the same money and invested it in the stock market. How many years are you going to be sitting at that point, considering where you are now? So a great thing, one time guy drew an arch, it was like the St. Louis arch, and he said, let's say this is your date of birth here at the bottom of this side of the arch. And this is your whole life. Where are you right now? Make an X on the arch where you are right now. And everybody put the X at a different point. Problem is, the answer is the same for everybody. You have no idea where you are in that arch. You could be right near the bottom at the other side. You might be less than halfway through. But being that, you should be thinking about the end game. How is this going to fit in with the later years of your life? Should be building a saleable asset that then, which sounds terrible, but a good reason for selling a business is health issues. I built this business for 20 years, now I'm having health issues, I've got to sell. That makes sense to me. So, my recommendation is that you really do your research. It's another thing people run from, they don't like doing market research. Sounds boring. It'd be boring. Brother, you better figure out how many competitors you have and what's the average revenue or there's just all these things you need to know. Be clear about your why and in terms of risk aversion, minimize your risk early on because you're learning two things. You're learning your business and you're learning business. So as you learn business, you can take risks with a higher probability of success because you know more about what you're doing. So I believe that's everything I have for you. If anybody would like to follow up with me later, my contact information is there. Frank, thank you so much. Thank you so much.